most people are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar, that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master before he had finished praying. Rebecca showed up, y'all. The Bible declares she came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, the virgin. No man, no man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled the jar, came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my Lord. She said and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. Watch this. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all his camels. Father, now in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for this opportunity to minister the word of God to the people of God, hiding myself, God, now behind your cross that men may not see, give honor, glory to Greg. All glory, all honor goes to you and it is in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says... Um, I want to throw a couple of statistics at you guys um, on this morning. I want to be very, very transparent about our subject matter of what we're dealing with. Um, 50% um, of all marriages end in divorce. F 50%. So, so I've, I've done quite a few weddings. I've actually turned down quite a few weddings as well. Um, people have asked me to marry them, and, and I said no. Um, yeah, because of this statistic, so it's, it's like, it's like, you want to get married? You want to get married? I don't think y'all going to make it. <laughs> I mean, think about this for a second. How many of you guys would work 40 hours a week? And at the end of the week on Friday, you go up to your boss and your boss says, you worked hard, we're proud of you, but it's a 50% chance you won't get paid. <laughs> how, how many of you guys would stay at that company? Who would ever even apply for the company? Now, now hear me, because that's the sta same statistics when it comes to, to marriage. 50%, let me throw something else at you. 57% of men admit to committing infidelity in any relationship. 54 percent of sisters. <laughs> 20 percent of men and 13 men and 13 percent of women have committed adultery at least once in their marriage. Th this is a trip right here. 74 percent of men say they would have an affair if they knew they wouldn't get caught. Hold up before you take a picture, S my sister. Hold up before you take a picture, because 68% of women say the same thing. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of tripping because, you know, with this whole idea of marriage, you know what I'm saying, Pastor? You know, if 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 it's really that bad, because I I wouldn't put money in the bank and it's a 50% chance that it won't be there tomorrow. I just wouldn't do that. So is marriage really, I mean, I mean, wh why we just can't, you know, get a little house, you know what I'm saying, cute little dog, we ain't got to get married, we just kind of work this thing out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if it don't work, my name on the lease, you just move out, get your own little spot, we ain't got to go through no legalities, nothing like that, it ain't work, so you know what I'm saying? So, oh, so why, somebody shout, why? So why even, <laughs> why go through this, man? Because God said it's not good for men to be alone. He says, man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife. God said in his word, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor with the Lord. Now, y'all, y'all got to help me for a second because, because see, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, um, I, I, I live most of my life by deductive reasoning. And, you know, um, I was picked on quite a bit um, when I was, in, you know, in elementary. So if a guy look at me and say, I'm going to get you today. 
that means don't get on the bus. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> I ain't, I'm walking home today. I'm not riding the bus. So, so I mean, that's kind of what that, that, that means. So with, with this being said, looking at it statistically, 50% of men, 50% of marriages end up in divorce, 74%, 68% of women uh, say if they could cheat, they would, 54% of men actually do cheat, 40-something uh, percent of women actually do cheat. With these statistics, it sounds like maybe we sh shouldn't do this, but God says what statistics say is a curse, I call it good. So either God is wrong or in the marriage arena, we doing something wrong. So with that being said, and yes, I changed my title. <laughs> Sorry, Ty. I want to talk for the next couple of weeks about the secret sauce to a strong marriage. <laughs> I want to talk about that secret sauce. Because watch this, some couples are struggling, but everybody ain't struggling. Some couples are really tripping going through, but everybody ain't tripping. Everybody ain't going through. And this is what I learned because I've studied mass marriage, not just from a, a, a biblical standpoint, not just from a, a book of reading, but I've studied people's lives and marriages that are really good. There are some ingredients within that marriage that are common in all marriages that have a strong foundation. And I want to, I want to deal with that on, on today. And, and this is what I want to do for the next couple of weeks. Again, we're going to be standing on Genesis chapter number 24. Now understand, Genesis is the book of the beginning. There is no major revelation within Exodus and Revelation that doesn't have its foundation in Genesis. From sanctification, justification, salvation, propitiation, uh, substitutionary atonement, every major uh, uh, theme of revelation uh, that, that's in the rest of the book has its foundation in the book of Genesis. So Genesis is a, is a very, very important book. What's interesting about Genesis, and I found this out just a couple of weeks ago, the very longest chapter in the book of Genesis is not about creation. It's not about salvation. It's not about sanctification. The longest chapter in the book of Genesis, the book of foundation, has to do with marriage. So we're going to take the next couple of weeks and, and just extrapolate a couple of principles of what God has to say concerning marriage in the life of Abraham finding a son, finding a wife for his son, Isaac. Can the people of God say amen to that? Now, I'm gonna, not going to reteach on last week's message, but th the first principle that we, we looked at, and I summed it up in, ep in essence, that a couple needs to grow together. Somebody shall grow together. So, so Abram, he's going to send his servant to find um, Isaac a wife, and he's going to say just straight up, don't get a wife for my son amongst the daughters of the Canaanites. We, we ain't even going that way. The Apostle Paul echoes, and he basically says, be ye not unequally yoked. This is the same idea that Abraham is trying to communicate, because when you are yoked together with somebody, it works great if you guys are heading in the same direction. You can go further. You can pull more if, you, if you're on the same page. But if you have two different animals, watch this, by default, they're going to pull in opposite directions. So, so for, for the married couples, for those who are already married that are believers, you need to make sure that you grow together. Don't allow your husband to outgrow you. S sisters, don't just depend on your husband to be the spiritual leaders. And brothers, for sure, don't just depend on your wife to be a spiritual leader. You guys need to go. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we need to grow. We need to grow. So that's what it means for the married couple. What it means for the, un for, for, for the individual that's single, the Bible declares, be ye not unequally yoked. If you know brother man ain't saved, don't even go there. But pastor, he a good person, but he ain't saved. He got a good job. He ain't on drugs. <laughs> he ain't in jail. <laughs> so you go down the list of things that's good about him, but if he's not saved, because how many, w w watch this, watch this. How many know, man, when, when you follow in Christ, he requires you to live by faith. And faith doesn't make sense sometimes. I'm, I'm trying to help somebody in this place. Faith says that I'm going to come into a place because the Bible declares to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And if you go into church all the time, after a while, if the brother don't understand, if the sister don't understand, she's going to fight your commitment to God because it seems as though that your commitment to God is taken away from and sure don't be no faith for tither. The devil is a lie. Because if you don't understand give and it shall be given unto you, anything that you give, especially to, especially to that preacher, 
Anything you give to the house of God seems as though that it's a subtraction from my household. So the scripture teaches us to start the foundation equally yoked. And once you're married, you should actually grow together. Can you say amen to that? So I want to dive a little bit deeper into the text. And this is where we are. Abraham has already commissioned his servant to go to his home country to find a wife for his son Isaac. Now, now watch what the servant is looking for when it comes to a wife for his master's son. Verses number 14 of chapter number 24 says, may it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Watch this. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulders. Now watch this. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water for, from your jar. She says, drink, my Lord. 19 says, after she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran. Somebody shout, she ran back. She ran back to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all his camels. Now, now watch this. This is a commentary highlight from the IVP Bible background commentary. The author says a camel that has gone a few days without water could drink as much as 25 gallons. In contrast, the jars that were used for water would usually hold no more than three gallons. Now, now watch me for a second because I'm not the mathematician. My wife is. So 10 camels, we learned that in the early text. And each camel, if he's thirsty enough, can drink up to 25 gallons of water. So that's 250 gallons of water that's needed to water these 10 camels. She only has a bucket that can hold three gallons of water. So if you take 250 gallons of water that's needed divided by the three-gallon scooper, that's 84 trips back and forth from the well to where the camels are. So watch, I, I need you, I'm getting too excited, mother. Watch what the servant actually prays for. He says, may it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, she says, drink. And after giving me a drink, she'll say, I'll run back 84 times to water your 10 camels too. I really, I really want to help because the servant knows that his master, Abraham, is a multi-millionaire. And whoever married Abraham in the next chapter, he's going to die. So whatever Abraham has, it's inherited by Isaac. And the wife of Isaac, the moment, the moment they get married, she becomes an instant multi-millionaire. So there are some particular qualities that this girl had. She can't, y'all come on, she just can't be from the hood. You understand what I'm saying? She can be from the hood, but she can't have hood in her. <laughs> Just in case I unfitted somebody. Well, I'm from the hood. Well, you, you can be from the hood. Anyway. <laughs> so the girl that's going to be a multimillionaire, the day she says, I do, there's a characteristic that she has to have. Not only does she have to be equally yoked with my master's son, she has to have a selfless attitude of service. And I'm telling you that this is a major ingredient when it comes to the secret sauce of marriage because many of us get into marriage to be served rather than to serve. I, I, I want to help. I want to help because, because we looked at some of the wrong motives last week. We looked at some of the wrong motives when it comes to getting married. We said uh, to fulfill my romantic dreams, to prove that I'm stable, to prove that I'm not a homosexuality. That's why I'm getting married. So I can have sex whenever I want. <laughs> You're going to be disappointed, brother. It's going to be a headache spirit. It's going to be a stomach spirit. It's going to be a toe ache spirit. It's just going to be, I don't feel like it tonight spirit. It's going to be a lot of spirits. <laughs> watch this, watch this. To, es <laughs> to escape, happy Father's Day. <laughs> to escape from my painful home life. Why you want to get married to have children? 
I want somebody to make me happy. I, I, wanna, I want financial security. Yeah, I want to get even with the joker that dumped me. That's why I want to get married. So why are these all wrong? I'll tell you why they're wrong. Because all of these reasons have to do with you. When we're talking about biblical marriage, because watch, watch this. If God is the author of marriage, which he is, he is the first one that put Eve with Adam, then we need to look to the creator's program when it comes to marriage. And God's program is marriage is not about making you happy. It's about you selflessly serving to make the other person happy. And marriage works well when you have two selfless giving people that are committed to doing whatever I can to make her day brighter. I want to do whatever I can to make his day lighter today. When you have people like that loving each other, you got a happy marriage. Marriages are not working because there's too much selfishness involved. This thing is, a, is about, it's about you. It's about what I get out of it. And that's why divorce happens like this. Because, watch this, if I got married to be happy, when I stop being happy, I'm out. If I chose to be married because of some romantic dream that I had, and the dream doesn't come to fruition, I'm out and I'm trying to find somebody else to fulfill my desires. So what, what the writer, the picture that's painted here in, in Genesis 24, it echoes again to Ephesians 20, 5, 21 through 33. I want to read this. The Bible declares, submit, somebody shout to one another. N now understand, in a marriage, there is mutual submission of both the husband and the wife. I know we just highlight the wife, but the scripture speaks of mutual submission, and I'm getting ready to show you how. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband, uh, husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved it. Now, let's press pause for us. Because sisters, they'll trip on verse number 24 for, sh for sure. Church submits to Christ, also, so wives submit to the husbands and everything. He's talking to the wives. Then he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave him. You know, Christ died for the church, right? He, I mean, he like, so you want me to love her like, what's that song? Hug him high, smack him high, hug his head. That's love. You want to love? This one lady, she said, she said, my husband always says he'll die for me, but he never does. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a lot funnier in my head. <laughs> but I, uh, husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. And this is a huge responsibility or any other blemish but holy and blameless in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Yeah. Wife abusers are self-haters. The reason you hit her is because you actually hate yourself. Because you love her just like you love your own body. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. Now watch this. For this reason, a man will, somebody shall leave. Now we're going to deal with this next week. We're going to deal with leaving and cleaving leaving and cleaving because if you're going to marry her you don't need to be a mama's boy for the rest of your life if, if you're going to marry him 
then you need to let him be the priest of your home, not your daddy. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, here it is. Each one of you also must love his wife as he loved himself, and the wife must respect her husband. What Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 is highlighting is both the role and the responsibility of marriage. Role. On a baseball team, the pitcher is a role. His responsibility is to strike people out. So in the marriage, both the lady and the husband, they have a role. And based on their role, they have a responsibility. The role for the husband is simply to lead through love. You are, you, are, you are to lead through love. The wife's role is to honor through respect. Honor through respect. And because his role is to lead through love, his responsibility, therefore, is, watch this, to render service that communicates love to his wife. And the wife's responsibility is to render service that communicates honor to her husband. So, my role is to lead my wife through love. My responsibility is to serve her in a manner that communicates love to her. Likewise, her responsibility is serve me in a manner that communicates honor and respect. Marriage breaks down when the couples stop serving. Because, brothers, your service communicates love. Sisters, your service communicates honor and respect. So if you stop serving, that means the only thing you're communicating is disrespect. Brothers, if you stop serving, the only thing you're communicating is lack of love, lack of care. And how long you going to be married feeling dishonored? Sisters, how long you going to stay connected feeling unloved? So he says, find God. I'm looking for somebody who has a selfless servants mentality that sees a need because under, understand what selfless is God I want to help and brother John it took me a while to get it it took me a while to get it my wife we've been married what 20 years now 20 almost 20 thank you almost 20 years now she was so gracious almost 20 years first few, few years was hell she said the first two I said the first seven <laughs> five, I don't know, five to seven, ten. <laughs> and the reality is, bro, both of us needed a check. We could have signed up and got a check. They could have checked us in the crazy house. We could be getting paid right now, girl. Why we ain't get paid? <laughs> you could have committed me, I would have committed you. We was crazy, arguing over crazy stuff. It's ridiculous. So, watch this. What I'm teaching, I knew because I had seen models, but how many know just because you know it don't mean you... David said, that word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Sometimes you can have word in your head, can quote a lot of scriptures, but it really ain't in you. So you know just enough scriptures to co convict your own self. So, so watch this. So I know what the word says. I stopped serving my wife. And let me tell you what really saved our marriage. And it was nobody but God. It was nobody but God. Because, because I stopped serving as a punishment because what I felt she wasn't doing for me. So I stopped showing her love because I wasn't feeling the honor. And then there were times she stopped serving, showing honor because she wasn't feeling the love. This is what really saved our marriage. And again, it's nothing but the grace of God. The grace of God was that we didn't stop serving at the same time. There was times I had faith and I kept serving her. I kept serving her, although she had mentally quit, mentally checked out. I was still in position trying to honor God. And then there was times I was like, man, forget it. It is what it is. I took my wedding ring one time and just slung it. Just threw it. And she was like, no. 
Watch this. I threw mine. What if she would have threw hers? Because when I threw mine, I was done. What if she would have threw hers at the same time? You know, when I took off my ring and I threw it, you know what I was saying? I was saying non-verbally, I'm done. I ain't serving you no more. I ain't catering to you no more. I'm not demonstrating no type of love towards you no more. What if she would have demonstrated the same thing? Marriage would have been over. And I'm telling you that some of you guys, some of you guys' relationship is shaky. And this is why I shake it is because neither one of you have committed to serving selflessly. Some of you guys are on the same roller coaster that my wife was on. My wife and I was on years ago. You stop serving, but she keep on. Then she quit. Then you like, come on, girl, we can make it. And then you get tired and you quit. And then she like, well, come on, we can. But neither one of you guys have actually committed to. Say. Here's the thing about selfless serving. Abraham's servant could have been Eleazar. We're not for sure. But he says, God, the one who offers me water and then who makes the offer to go 84 times back and forth to give camels water and not know if she's going to receive any benefit at all. I'm going to talk about sex in a couple of weeks. But brothers, married brothers, when you think you're going to get blessed that night, you'll be like, hey, what can I do? Let me, let me, let me fold the clothes. So I'm going to fold the clothes, boy. Ooh, any dishes need to be washed. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Let me mow the lawn. <laughs> Ain't we got a rider? Yeah, but, but you don't need no rider. You understand what I'm saying? When you think you're going to get blessed, it's like you. But if you got a selfish mentality and you don't think you get nothing in return, you fold them old clothes. Matter of fact, they can stay there a couple of days. <laughs> Look, I'm going to wear them anyway. <laughs> they might as well stay on the couch. When I get ready for this shirt, it'll be on the couch. <laughs> That's when you have the mentality that I'm serving. Ah, uh, man, let me tell you, I've I really been tripping the past couple of days, man, because not just, I, it's been several years, uh, at least two years, and God's just really dealing with me differently. And um, I'm still not quite used to how he's speaking to me right now because it's just, just, it's just next level for me. Um, and so most of my life, uh, I've been taught to be goal-oriented, to keep an eye on the scoreboard, you know, and I'm a very, very competitive guy. I'm, I'm always, one. I got a scoreboard for everything because the scoreboard, in a sense, tells you what you're doing, how you're doing, right? Whether I'm winning, whether I'm losing, right? So, 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 so like in here, like at the end of the service, the guy's going to tell me how many people were here. They're going to tell me how many people were next door. It's, it's a scoreboard. I want to know how many people came today. And when it rained next week, I want to know how, how many people didn't come because <laughs> of the rain. It's, it's, it's a scoreboard. So God spoke to me about two weeks ago. And mother, he says, he says, don't focus on progress, focus on the process. Don't focus on the progress, focus on the process. Don't focus on whether you're winning or losing, just keep doing what you're doing. So just yesterday, I'm sitting and I'm just kind of trying to conflate these two ideas because I, I, this is not how you've dealt with me in the past. I've always been goal-oriented, goal-driven. You show me the score. I do what I need to do to, to get where I need to go. Now I'm feeling something that's saying, don't watch the scoreboard. So I was praying on this, and God just, this is fresh, fresh off the press. God spoke this to me just yesterday. He says, the scoreboard determines strategy, not effort. Depending on whether I'm up or down determines what play I'm going to call. But the scoreboard never dictates my level of energy or effort. It doesn't matter if we're down 14 or we up 14 in the fourth quarter. My energy and my effort is the same. And some of us allow external factors in our relationships to determine what level of energy we're going to give. 
when God says, I want 100 every day. You do know that he's calling for active duty Christians, not reserved in National Guard Christians, right? Not seasonal Christians, not, not weekend Christians, but Monday through Friday, excuse me, Monday through Sunday, Sunday through, y'all know what I'm saying. Every day. And that's the type of selfless commitment that he's requiring of us. Jesus got down on his hands and knees, got ready to wash his disciples' feet. And they tripping. They like, no, you're not about to wash my feet. What's up with you? Jesus says, no, 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 no. Those who are going to be the greatest among you will be the greatest servant. And when it comes to relationship, too many of us, we just want to be served, but we really don't want to get in the fight and actually serve. And if you want your relationships to grow to the next level, understand, my friend, you have to develop a servant's mentality, a selfless servant mentality that I'm not even. Matter of fact, I shot a text to myself and I said, God, my life, I'm not doing it for nobody. I'm just doing it for you. Because that's when you really start serving selflessly when you do it to the glory of God and not for the uh, accolades and applause of people. Are y'all with me in this place? I want I want to help for a second. I want to talk about four barriers to marital servitude, and then I'll be out of your way. Four barriers to ser marital servitude. Because if it's going to work, you got to serve each other. If it's going to work, you got to learn to serve each other. Here's the first one. It's par parental influence. You actually never had a good model of servitude in your house. So how can you emulate, imitate, duplicate something that you've never seen? Mom and dad, they didn't do nothing but fight each other. They played the manipulation games that some of y'all might be playing right now. If he ain't doing what I think he ought to be doing, I'm going to stop doing what I need to do. Come on. And then now some of you guys like me, I actually grew up in a house where my father, he modeled, he modeled great service to my mother. But where I went wrong is I tried to give my wife the same thing my daddy gave my mama. And I found out my wife ain't my mama. Yeah, I'll never forget. My, my dad, in, during, um, what's that fake holiday? What's that fake holiday? Valentine's Day, yeah, that one. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. It's still Father's Day. <laughs> and who, who, said, who said Valentine? Who was it? Who was it? Some brothers. <laughs> so, so, so Father's Day, watch this. My dad would go out the day before, on the 13th, and he'd get these big boxes of chocolate. And the morning of Valentine's Day, he'd go in my sister's room, Jan Fundrell, he'd go in my mom's room, and he'd give him this big box of chocolate. So when I first started dating, bam, big box of chocolate. And every girl I've ever dated got chocolate and loved it. Except for her. I remember the first Valentine's Day, I was like, <laughs> look, I ain't get the cheap one. Bam. And she looking like, what's all this mixed up stuff? I don't know what it is. I don't even eat it. Trying to, trying to serve her the same way my dad. I, I'll never forget our first, I think it was our first Christmas. I bought her the perfect gift that my dad would have bought for my mom. He, I bought my wife a turtle lamp. Was it birthday? Same thing. I bought her a turtle lamp. It was, it was so precious. And do you know she didn't want that turtle lamp? Y'all know what I did with it? I gave it to my mama. Do you know where it is to this day? At my mama house, <laughs> displayed. She like, baby, I remember you gave me this turtle. This is so precious. I look at her like, nah. <laughs> Sometimes you can have a bad parental influence, and then there are times where you make the mistake that I did, where you try to duplicate exactly what your parents did, and, and, and you, can't, you can't do that. Here's the second one. Um, Barriers to marital servitude, personal needs. What do you mean by that? Sometimes you try to give the person what you need and you think they
they ought to be satisfied. Jesus. I got a story. I'm not sure if I need to tell it. I think I'm going to wait till next week. Should I tell it, y'all? Y'all want to hear it? You want to know all my business, don't you? Now, I'm 40. That was the day I was 21. And for my, like, 21st or 22nd birthday, I'm getting mad right now. Because, see, my wife, she, like, you know, pedicure, like, not, I know now, you know, if she want to, you know, a nice gift, you know, pedicure, manicure, you know what I'm saying? So I can do that. For my 22nd birthday, everybody shout, shame, first lady, shame, shame, <laughs> shame, 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 shame. This African-American sister, <laughs> I'm telling you, okay. <laughs> brothers, uh, my married brothers, let me hear you say, yeah. This is what she did, man. This girl, chat, got dressed up in lingerie, gave me a pedicure. And then rolled over and went to sleep and said, happy birthday. <laughs> Look, dog. I'm sitting, I'm sitting there like, I'm sitting there like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she goes, say, happy birthday, honey. The devil is alive. Are you serious? Pedicure is what you want. Matter of fact, you could have skipped the pedicure. <laughs> you, you ain't have to give me no pedicure at all. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> pedicure, so we, we miss it because sometimes we, we're so focused on what we want, we give people what we want and we think they ought to be. Brother was not satisfied. He was very angry, though. Can I get a brother to say Amen. Barriers to marital servitude. Somebody shout, we got to serve each other. Serve. And, and watch this. This works well in marriage, but in all actuality, it works well in all relationships. All re I, I don't have a whole lot of friends. I don't have a whole lot of friends, but my friends, my friends know I'm a good friend to have because I'm going to always bless you with no strings attached. I'm, I'm just going to do that because I'm, I'm, I try to demonstrate a selfless attitude when it comes to service. So I don't keep record of I did this and I did that. No, when I did that, because watch this, the Bible declares, given it shall be given unto you. God never says where it's going to be given to you from. So all I know is he's going to bless me for what I do for other people. So I don't have to look stupid at somebody when I bless them like, okay, where am I at? No, mm -mm. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got you. So these barriers, parental influence, I'm out of time. Happy Father's Day. Personal needs, number three, poor communication. Poor communication. Again, I'm 40. What I needed at 21 is the same thing I needed at 40. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, my wife, she used to say, she used to say, can't you just hold me? And I'm like, no, I just can't just hold you. That was 21. 40, I'm not, I'm like, baby, just hold me tonight. Just hold me. <laughs> Do you actually know what your spouse needs? Watch this, in this season of their lives. Because you can be giving them stuff from the old season and you frustrated because it worked last season, but it's not it's a different season, different place. Yeah. The, the, the way I demonstrated after, after my wife's uh, grandfather died, I mean, she really, really went through some things. And I had to adjust my level of service to where she was. Because if I kept giving her what she needed, then I was going to frustrate our relationship because she's in a different place in space mentally. Are y'all with me in this place? 
Now, I didn't start out that way because the first couple of days, first couple of weeks, I was doing stuff for her that I normally do, and I was mad because she wasn't satisfied. Like, what's wrong with you? Have you considered she's lost her grandfather, that this is a significant individual in her life? So it's something extra or something different that you're going to need for this age and stage of her life. And sometimes, sometimes, well, let me say it like this. It's great if you can communicate it. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, you need to be a private investigator. That means you need to discern what they need. Okay, so, so example, I asked my <laughs> Jesus, and, and communication, learning it, sometimes it works against you. So, you know, I was reading this book year, years ago, and it was emphasizing that you need to ask your wife, what, how can I serve you? So I asked her one day, how can I serve you? She's like, you can get your clothes up out of the middle of the floor. That's how you can serve me. <laughs> now, what y'all think that did to a brother? <laughs> well, praise God, at that particular moment, just that particular moment, I was a little bit more mature. <laughs> And I read between the lines. It wasn't about the clothes on the floor. It was about help around the house. And because I discerned she wanted me to help more around the house, I started by default doing more work around the house. Amen. Parental influences, personal needs before communication. Anybody getting anything out of this? Number four, um, barriers to marital servitude, um, bitterness and unforgiveness. Bitterness and unforgiveness. Okay, I want to want to deal with this, and I'm I'll get out of your way. So I'm I'm the kind of guy. Um, I'm at my best under pressure. I really am. And and there are times when psychologically, I have to put myself as if I'm under pressure, just to pull that extra out of me. I do that to myself. So. Many times when my wife and I, we've gone through situations, uh, that pressure pulled the best out of me. And, and that was good for the moment, but it was bad for the long haul. Let me show you why. And, and again, um, we've made many mistakes. Um, we've said many hurtful things. We've done hurtful things to one another. But the past 19 years, almost 20 years, has not been easy at all. Mm, hasn't been easy worth it <laughs> worth it absolutely worth it so there were times when we went through things early in our marriage that I muscled through it and we came out okay so the situation is resolved whatever was needed to be remedied it, it, it worked out but when we walked away from the situation the situation was fixed but I didn't take into consideration what it had actually done to my heart. And so I was walking around years with a bleeding heart and didn't even know it because the situation is fixed. It's almost like being in a car accident and breaking your leg. Well, the car is repaired. What about your leg? The situation is repaired, but... So that was a season in my marriage, man, when I was walking around, I'm talking about, I was just angry, just going off for every little thing. It was a type of anger as if she did something here. And so just the little smallest things, I would respond, and I'm, it was just, it was bad, man. So I started, you know, I took that thing to pray. I was like, God, why am I so, I just woke up mad. <laughs> Good morning, how you doing? How you doing? You all right? Because I'm Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, God, why am I feeling like this? Just mad at everybody. Don't nobody want to be around me. I'm just mad. And I asked God a question. Let me tell you something. There is one prayer, I promise you. There is one prayer you are guaranteed to get an answer to every single time. And it goes something like this. God, show me what's in me. Not like you. <laughs> now, warning, he will show, show you, <laughs> and it's going to break your heart. <laughs> yeah, you could, man. I was just re ready to resurrect somebody just in case we needed to. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was ready. <laughs> so I said, God, sh show me. And God showed me 
picture of something that me and my wife had went through years before. And, and it was, what, what, what we went through, that was a level of anger that was borderline hatred. Now again, we were both crazy, for sure. But it was like, I, say, I didn't say it that day, but as he was playing out the picture, I said to myself, I hate you. And I said, God, that's there. I didn't even know it. So watch this. During that particular season, it was hard for me to actually service her because I had this hidden bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness in my heart. Now watch this. God didn't send me to her, and, and I, didn't, I didn't have to go to her and say, I forgive you for what you did. No, that situation had already been remedied. We had actually already worked through that. It was what I went through. No, this is just between me and you, God. I need you to help me to process this anger and this bitterness out of my heart so I can start serving and loving my wife the way I'm supposed to. And there are some of you guys in here, that's where you are. It's not that you can't serve. It's not that you don't want to serve. You got something lodged in your heart that's preventing you from serving. So when you do get ready to do something good, it's something that always draws you back and say, nah, I ain't going to do it. They know I love them. But love is demonstrated in your actions. There was a dream that I had years ago, not associated with this particular event, just another event that I had. I was in a dream, and in the dream I was holding this guy in a bear hug like this. And um, I woke up out of the dream, and I asked God, what did that mean? And God spoke to me. And he said, it's impossible for you to grab a hold to what I have for you as long as you're holding on to a man. So the reality is, I was not only stopping progress with our marriage, I was stopping progress between me and God because of what I had in my heart. So I needed God to do something about this. But this is what God reminded me. Let me tell you what helped me. What helped me. God reminded me of the stuff he had to forgive me of. Before I got married, while I was married, stuff that I regret, things I did to my wife, apologized, we got past it, but still ashamed that I would talk like that, that I would act that way towards my, my wife. And God says, I forgave you. You know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is a gift that you give. And the only reason you're able to, you like the Lakers? Good, because you weren't getting this no way. This is just an example. These are my shorts. You ain't getting this because you don't even like the Lakers. Go LeBron. Yeah, Golden State. Congratulations to you guys. <laughs> Congratulations. Where all the Lakers fans are like. <laughs> so watch this. I can only give this away. He ain't gonna even take it, y'all. Watch this. I can only give this away. <laughs> See, he don't want to be blessed. <laughs> no, 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 no. Watch this. I can only give something that's first been given to me. And it's impossible to give forgiveness if you first hadn't really received it. You, you do know when it comes to forgiveness, some of you guys are hard on people because you're hard on yourself. You won't let people go because really you won't let yourself go. you still mad at yourself for stuff that you did. So if you can, won't receive forgiveness from God, how can you give something you ain't really... So God had to remind me, son, know your track record. So I had to go back, mother, and think about some stuff. Because God not only know what you did, watch this, if circumstances would have been right, he know what you would have did. Boy, it's real quiet up in here. <laughs> because what you did was bad, but had the opportunity to avail itself, 
Had the environment been really conducive? Had they made you just, just one, one degree matter? You punched him, but you would have got a gun and shot him. And some of y'all did shoot him, but you would have killed him. God had to remind me. So what I did is I went in my little private prayer closet, and I began to thank God for forgiving me for my sins, for my shortcomings, for my failures, for my misperceptions. How, how, is, it, how is it that I just know what she's thinking? I already know what she's thinking of. I know you don't. You assuming. And your assumptions usually are wrong. Just tell the way she looked at me. You don't know nothing. So what happens was, and my wife, she, she, <laughs> she a trip. <laughs> so now I can't even do it. So I go to her sometimes. I say, I love you, sweetie. I love you. I love you. And, and I, I did that. I would start verbalizing. I love her. I love you. I love you, sweetie. I love you. And what it was doing as I was saying it and as I was praying it, it was changing my heart. I can't do it now because now she said, oh, you're doing that little meditated thing. You mad at me, ain't you? <laughs> so I can't, I can't even get away with it no more. I just do it in my head. I love you. I love you. <laughs> One of my mentors told me, he said, do love things until love comes back. So I start on purpose doing love things. And as I receive forgiveness and as I start demonstrating forgiveness towards her, God changed my heart. God changed my heart. And she's easy to love because what God did in my heart. And I want to pray today real quickly just for hurting people. Hurting people. People that have bitterness in their heart. You got unforgiveness in your heart. You holding somebody for what they did. And God says, let them go because I'm willing to let you go. Free them because I freed you. I want to pray for you today. And this is what happened, my friend. It's powerful. That anger, that borderline hatred. I was operating in hatred and didn't even know it. I was acting like everybody was, when really it was just something large there. That anger began to dissipate. It wasn't overnight, it wasn't in a moment, but as time went by, I just got lighter and lighter, and it was such a blessing. Mom, I woke up one morning <laughs> expecting, you, you know, some mornings you wake up and you, you think, well, I just gotta fight through it, I gotta muscle through it. There was a morning I woke up and I didn't have to fight through it no more because it was gone. It was gone. And I want to encourage you today to start the process because God wants you to serve. He wants you to love. But it's hard to love when you got bitterness and hatred in your heart. Did you guys receive this word on today? Come on and give God a hand clap of praise all over this building. <laughs> Woo! Heads bowed and eyes closed all over this building to my YouTube, Facebook Live family. Thank you guys so much for tuning in on today. I pray that your hearts were blessed, your minds renewed, lives strengthened. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.